Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really uh, glad to be here and uh, thankful for the opportunity to present here today. So my name is Joe Baldiga. I'm an education program manager with uh, Fanic America. So I work specifically in the education arena, um, working with high schools, community colleges, and universities to implement automation, CNC machines, uh, Industry 4.0 solutions. We partner with uh, Tech Ed Products, who's up here in the front. Um, they're our local rep here in the uh, New England area. Um, but I, I, I'll try to do the focus because I know we do have some academia here as well as uh, industry people. So we're going to kind of dive into to both realms of how FANUC uh, works in those different uh, markets. So I've been uh, fortunate enough uh, to be with FANUC, uh, FANUC for uh, coming up on two decades, so 12, uh, almost 23 years. Um, our headquarters is located in Rochester Hills, Michigan. So we have 1.2 million square feet of innovation space uh, there in Oakland County, just north of Detroit. Um, we are expanding though. We're getting ready to add another 800,000 square feet um, facility just uh, around the corner. So we're gonna call that our West Campus. And um, that will be uh, you know, really an opportunity to expand. So there's been a, a large proliferation of robotics and we continue to see that market grow um, as, as more and more Companies are trying to uh, eliminate some of those dirty, dangerous, difficult, and dull jobs um, and, and having struggles with workforce. Um, we're seeing just uh, a lot of growth and, and the need to automate to stay competitive globally. Um, so who is FANUC? Collectively, um, our CEO, Mike Chico, he likes to say that we are a team of problem solvers um, working to, uh, with one common goal, and that's to solve manufacturing challenges. Um, and we try to use that in the education space. So if you're familiar with like VEX Robotics or FIRST Robotics, they typically will have some sort of game or competition that the students have to, have to do. And, and a lot of the way manufacturers have a task and a problem that they're trying to solve, and that's what we do is we work with that. As I said, we're from, I'm from Michigan area, so a lot of people, um, you know, when I say uh, FANUC, uh, there's some people even in Michigan, which is largely an automotive area. Um, so when I say, hey, I, I work for FANUC, usually a lot of people's eyes glaze over and they're like, well, what's that? You know, who, who's FANUC? And I said, well, you ever see the car commercials with the yellow robot arms that are welding the cars? That's who I, look, how, who I work for. And they go, oh, okay. Um, but that's only a small market that we're in. Um, you know, so really, obviously in Michigan, the big three, but we're in everything from, from the food you're eating. You know, a lot of that stuff can be handled by ro robots to electronics to clothing. Um, uh, aerospace, die casting plastics, you know, there isn't much that isn't touched by automation and a lot of the times it's gonna be a FANUC product that's working in those. Uh, Bloomberg called us the Microsoft you've never heard of. So again, if you're not in automation, um, you wouldn't necessarily know what who FANUC is. Um, but we are definitely the, the number one um, worldwide automation supplier. Um, and that's not puffery, it's not bra you know, us bragging. Really, um, we've been around since the mid-1950s as really the originators of the first NC controls. Um, there was an MIT study that was first done um, on NC controls, and we had a, a group of ragtag engineers out of Fujitsu at the time um, said, hey, there's some commercial viability there, and then took that study and was able to commercialize it and come up with the, some of the first NC machines. And as technology advances, then it became CNC machining, um, and robotics is another portion of that. At the core of our technology uh, is servo motor control. We're really good at serv controlling servo motors, and that's really all a robotic arm is. It's a bunch of servo motors with known mechanical links that we're controlling uh, the, the motion and synchronizing those, mo those motors to move together. Uh, CNC machine is going to be the same thing, controlling X, Y, and Z in the spindle. And we're able to get a lot of feedback on those. So as, as Bill presented earlier about being able to get a lot of technology um, a lot of data from those servo motors, um, we we're, were able to capture a lot of that. So that, similar to how like Honda, for example, built their whole empire on small internal combustion engines, whether it was for uh, motorcycles, scooters, um, all the way up into cars. So they built their empire on that. We're just really good at servo motor controls. So we recently just passed um, a couple milestones there for um, robotics. We have over a million robots installed globally. Um, so just definitely the, the dominant brand in there, 5.2 million CNCs installed globally, uh, 400,000 robo machines. So that would be our FANUC robo drill. We have a robo cut wire EDM or robo shot plastic injection mold machines. We also have a robo nano, which is um, basically pushing around uh, atoms. It's so, uh, so accurate. Um, but just give you a, an, an idea of where we're at. And then from that standpoint too, when you look at the market that's used, particularly in, in the Americas, we, 
we are the lion's share of the market. So basically kind of two out of every three robots, I would say, um, in the in in the U United States is a FANUC. So we are about 65% market share. And the same is true for our CNC controls. Um, it, I think most people here are familiar with uh, maybe manufacturing, but for those who are not, when I talk to you know some people, what's a CNC? Well, that's the, the, the brain of a machine, and then they pair up our motors with that brain and, and put those in a variety of machines. Um, so that's where we are, our CNC systems. Um, so here's a kind of a variety of applications. Like I said, so we are in, in a diverse group um, a, a lot of diverse industries, and our, our marketing department did a pretty nice job putting together a, a, a video um, to show some of those applications.
So I think that's pretty impressive to see all the wide variety of applications that robots can potentially be utilized in. Um, so it, in looking at our diverse customer base, so this is just a snapshot of some, some household names that uh, you, you may be familiar with, um, but certainly we're in a, a lot of other industries. So as I had mentioned, being from Michigan, primarily known for automotive. So automotive, direct automotive, represents about 30% of our, our business, and then another 20% is in the automotive components. Um, and then the other industry that's really growing is what we're referring to as general industry, anything outside of that automotive sector. Um, and we experienced, uh, even coming out of COVID, about a 30% growth in those areas. Um, and, it, and it's not that uh, automotive went down. Automotive was still very high during that, that time, time frame. Um, but just a really, um, I think COVID really exposed some of the uh, faults that we have in our supply chain. Um, and that general industry market uh, really grew um, pretty dynamically post-COVID. And that kind of tracks with, um, so the Robotics Industries Association or uh, Association for Advancing Automation A3, that's really the main organization uh, that, that tracks a lot of the robot installations. That seemed to be true for what's you know, falling under that other category in food and consumer goods, that there was a pretty big uptick in the general industry market com coming out of COVID. Um, so as we mentioned, disruption in our supply chain, you know, prior to COVID, a lot of people probably wouldn't even, what's supply chain, you know, does that even, you know, wouldn't know what that is, but now it's pretty common that a uh, household, household thing that, okay, well, I want this thing and I can't get it now. There's long lead times. There's all these issues. You know, we recall during, during COVID, you know, the issues with toilet paper, you know, um, and, and we're concerns about meat and all the, the microchip issues. And you know, we have uh, parking lots back in Michigan where at the, at the time because of the semiconductor issues there were trucks that would be sitting in these lots that they'd put a chip in drive it over to this lot park it pull that chip out and then put in another one and wait for for that shipment to come in from overseas um, you know and there, there's issues there with microchips protecting our intellectual properties the chips act and trying to reshore and bring some of that stuff back um, PPE during COVID you know there was a lot of um, you, know, you know, need to quickly you know, pivot and turn to create some of those, uh, you know, create more masks and, you know, trying to strive for that vaccine. Uh, vehicle electrification is another area that's growing considerably with increases in automation. Uh, E-commerce, you know, being able to click add to cart, you know, and it show up at your door was was a huge boom during that time. We were all home, uh, you know, shopping and everything. And then also um, pivoting and in, in trying to address education and how do we change the workforce that as we become more automated. Um, and a lot of that effort, so we're, we're seeing a, a, you know, a pull on our supply chain um, from a lot of that, you know, that exposure, but then we also are seeing a lot of reshoring initi initiatives that I mentioned, the CHIPS Act, bringing stuff locally, trying to manufacture here, um, and that's going to push more and more um, need for more and more jobs and pulling of those talents. So traditionally in a manufacturing in environment, you would be kind of competing against other manufacturers. But now as you're going out into these other markets where we are in e-commerce and food and other applications, it does create a, a, a toll on the talent pools and the potential skill sets that are out there. Um, FANUC for, has, for a long time, even since the, the early 2000s, um, we had a, a campaign called Save Your Factory, and the way to compete was by automating, using automation to reduce costs, to keep your, 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 your operations here in the states. Um, you know, we have a, a skills gap. You know, they, they predict there'll be 2.4 million jobs could go unfulfilled by, by 2030 if we don't pivot and start to change how we uh, train and educate students, um, whether it's micro-credentials, uh, two-year degree, getting into a four-year degree. Um, when I talk to students, though, you know, this is scary for manufacturers. That, all right, where, where are we going to find, find these people to fill these jobs? Um, but for students, I say to them, because I travel across the country and, and speak to students, well, I said, this is an opportunity for you. This is an opportunity for you to get a skill um, with just a certification, get a good entry level job, uh, you know, a li that living wage that people are, you know, trying to, to work for, get in there, get a good, good job. And then a lot of companies even offer tuition reimbursement. And there's even such a, a, a fight for talent. Some places are even doing signing bonuses. Um, so in addition to FANUC being a big autom automation and problem solver for ma manufacturers, we are educators. Um, so in 2008, um, when uh, there was the big recession hit, and I recall there was a lot of you know, layoffs going on and um, buyouts and, 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 and in Michigan in particular, and I'm sure around here there was, it was challenging, but the housing market crash. 
Um, and a lot of those jobs were you know, either outsourced, but it was, it was a problem. Well, FANUC, we work with you know, those automotive companies three, four years in, in advance knowing that there's new programs coming up. And we saw that the baby boomers were retiring, that there was a large talent pool of knowledgeable people that were leaving the workforce, and this was gonna be a problem, and we needed to find a way to backfill that. So we started our certified education uh, robot training program um, as a, it's a train the trainer program. So it's a partnership between FANUC and the school. We train the instructor, they have a robot. Um, we offer e-learn curriculum for the students, our RoboGuide simulation software. And since that time, we've partnered with over 1,500 schools and aligning the skills that students are learning so that when they, when they go through a program and then they walk into the factory, the robot that they're learning on in the classroom is the same as what they would see in the factory or the CNC machine that they're working on in the, in the classroom would be the same as what they see in industry. Um, and, and a lot of times we get that categorization that robots take jobs. Um, you know, and, there, and there's some element that's true to that. And as I suggested, when we actually when we evaluate a, a good robot application, we, we say, well, is it, is it dirty? Is it dangerous? Is it difficult? Or is it dull? Just mundane, boring, repetitive. Um, you know, but if any of those areas, it checks off any of those four Ds, that's a good robot application. That's maybe also a job that a human shouldn't be doing. It's a job that somebody wouldn't want to do, sit there all day putting an, a bolt into something just mindlessly. They would almost be, in, in my eyes, kind of torturous. You have an opportunity where you could train that individual and upskill them. They could get a higher paying wage, and then they could service, maintain, and, and work with the robots. So it's not that automation is a big threat to our jobs. It's really our inability to properly utilize automation and, and train our workforce to use it because it, it is going to be how we are going to compete in, into the future. So part of that, um, you know, trying to attract students to manufacturing is a challenge because the only class in school typically where they, they learn about it outside, you know, we're trying to get more STEM knowledge, but typically it's been history class. You know, that's where they would talk about manufacturing and it would be Henry Ford and the Model T and how they made the assembly line. So we have to do a paradigm shift. We have to show students that manufacturing is high tech. Um, it's innovative. The, we're over here on this collaborative robot there. There's a, there's a tablet. We have a generation of kids that have grown up with cell phones, tablets. They are, now they're all screenagers, as we call it. So, you know, they're on their screens all the time. So, but it's intuitive for them. The technology is easy, easy to use. They jump on, they're brave with it. They're not scared. Um, you know, they're not scared. Um, and, and that is, can be a barrier to entry. I think a lot of times, uh, even maybe as manufacturers, you say, well, robots are pretty high tech and, and advanced. And I think students have that same fear factor too. Um, for a while at FANUC, I said I've been with FANUC over 20, 22 years now. Um, and one, in one of my roles, I was a training instructor. My wife used to say, you know, how do you do that all day? Go in and, and program robots and teach it. She thinks I'm punching in zeros and ones and figuring out forward kinematics and physics and all this stuff. And, and to be honest, it's, it's not that difficult. It's actually pretty easy, so don't tell her that it's not that hard because she at least thinks I'm smart at one thing. Uh, so we'll just keep that between us. Um, but it's that barrier to entry, that getting rid of that fear factor for the students, but also as, uh, as if you're considering automation, that could be the challenge is we want to automate, but where am I going to get the talent? Where am I going to get people that know how to use this? Well, we're trying to solve that in two, two ways, working with our customers saying, hey, we don't have the skilled talents. Well, we have this certified education robot training program and the CNC program where we are training and certifying students and going through the same curriculum that you, you could put your workforce through as an upskilling initiative. It's the same uh, curriculum. It's also bringing that training close to you instead of having to, tr we've got 26 locations throughout um, the Americas that are main like sort of training locations, if you will, but that could still be uh, you know, a cost prohibitive for you to send a, a large group of employees here. Well, the community college that's right down the road or the college that's nearby that participates in the FANUC program that could train and upskill your workforce is a great opportunity to get that training locally. Um, but we, it is, um, as I said, we do have to have this paradigm shift um, in the education space um, and, and try to connect with education, with the government, and industry. Um, there was a lot of times, uh, you know, I work with schools and some, they say, you know, we, we try to work, count, contact this manufacturer nearby and they, they won't let us in the door. Or the only contact they make is, hey, we've got this, um, this old piece of equipment, we're going to take it to the scrapyard and junk it. Do you want it to train students on? And then this same employer will potentially, you know, come back to the college and say, 
hey, you guys aren't turning out the right kind of talent. You know, they're, they're not skilled on the latest and greatest technology. Well, the, there's, a, there's a, an issue there. If you're not coming to the plate and trying to partner with that school and trying to be on the advisory boards, say this is the type of equipment that we use, um, this is how you should be training the students. So the manufacturers need to be in, involved. Uh, a story I often hear is I have a, a friend who was a manufacturer. He went into a school, gave his presentation on, on, on employment. You know, hey, come work for my company, you know, to a bunch of kids in this, in this class. And they're kids, I guess, who were kind of already interested in manufacturing. He gave his presentation, thought he knocked it out of the park, went, park, went back to his office and was expecting to have all these resumes just pouring in to his email box. And nothing, crickets. So he called up the instructor and he said, hey, I don't know what's going on. Um, you know, I, I thought I did a pretty good presentation. I was expecting some interviews. He's like, well, you're like the fifth or sixth one that we've had this week that has come in and done that. The ones who win are the industry partners that are involved with the schools. They're mentoring. They're on the advisory committee and, and, and directing the course of how that curriculum is going to be taught. So there needs to be that, that chain of, of aligning what industry needs are to education and then getting support from the local government to kind of bridge that skills gap. Also changing the way that we teach, making it exciting for students to look at this and say, hey, this robot, you know, it's got a tablet, it's pretty cool. I mean, elementary school, they're learning block programming. And that's similar to the, the programming that's done on the, on the FANUC Teach Bennett. So you can create that pathway from kindergarten all the way through to, you know, advanced degrees. And teaching math concepts. Man, I used to think that I was horrible at math as a kid. And it was really just the white piece of paper with black numbers on it and just trying to figure that out. I remember my daughter was at a, a ballet class and I was sitting in the waiting room and there was this lady and she was grading uh, math worksheets and it was the Cartesian coordinates. So the X plane, Y plane, and you know, I was plotting out grids and I, I kind of look over at her and I say, hey, oh, those are Cartesian coordinates, you know? And she kind of gives me a weird look, like a, it's like a strange pickup line or something. But <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh, I said, I said, yeah, Cartesian coordinates. We use those in robotics and CNC machining all the time. She was like, really? And I said, yeah, that's, I mean, it's the foundation of, you know, you got X plane, Y plane, and I kind of went into the whole spiel about how we utilize them. And, um, but she's like, oh, that, that's cool. I can use that as an example now and when, when teaching the students of how you can utilize this. You know, you're not just plotting numbers. You know, X plane, Y plane, that's basics sort of G-code programming. The robot is the same thing. We use frames, joint angles, and calculating all those. And then it can get into, you know, advanced trig functions, but there is so much... Uh, opportunity for teaching at multiple levels using this type of equipment. So it's changing how we, how we go about it. You know, you look at a classroom, um, like I drove by and there was like a one-room schoolhouse and it's like some historic area, area here, but you look at that classroom that was in the one-room schoolhouse and it was set up like this. Desks in a row, somebody up front doing like that. And classrooms have not changed really or evolved that much from Back at the you know in the late 1800s, we're teaching in a similar way. Now we we have a bit more computerization, but for for young kids that are maybe hyperactive, hands-on, uh, kinesthetic learners, having the opportunity to get up out of their seat and and work hands-on and see the, you know our cause and effect. I programmed this, the robot did that. Oh, I get it, and, and, and it's a different reward mechanism in the learning process. So one of the base, biggest indicators for a student learning and deciding which direction they want to go is their experience. Um, we've come a long way with like Manufacturing Day opening up our doors. So if you participate in Manufacturing Day, thank you for inviting students to come in. But typically, manufacturers would, would in the past would have a, you know closed door. You know Willy Wonka's chocolate factory is closed. You can't get in and see what we're doing in here. But you know how are we going to recruit and advocate for our industry if we don't open up? And, and show students what can be done in the manufacturing world, as well as being mentors and talking to students. So it's giving them those experience. More than teachers, counselors, anything else, it is their individual experiences. Um, I was fortunate enough, my dad was a skilled trades electrician at Chrysler, and in 1994, they got a, a FANUC paint robot system. He came in for training, um, and I was in junior high at the time, and he said, oh man, that FANUC would be a great place to work one day. He says, the robots, the technology, it's not going anywhere. Um, we have a really nice campus. There's like a river that runs through the back and forest, and there's deer and stuff. And he was telling me all that, and somehow that stuck in my brain. And fortunately enough, um, you know, I, I was able to get in on the ground floor. I, I like to say that I'm a FANUC success story and that I, I almost literally started in the mailroom, part-time shipping and receiving, and gradually worked my way up through the company to where I am now. 
Um, but giving, I was fortunate to have that opportunity. There's a lot of you know, students that are in underserved communities, whether it's rural, urban, um, or just in general, it's not, you know, in academia, it's uh, if somebody goes to school and then becomes a teacher, their experience is, I started in kindergarten, went all the way through college, and then went back to school, you know, and didn't get a lot of outside experiences. Wouldn't have an opportunity to be able to sh shape or influence students. So getting them hands-on, showing them um, some of these things, so whether it's just small um, collaborative robot applications or simulation software, all the way up to these advanced systems. So this is a connected smart manufacturing system that we have with a FANUC RoboDrill, uh, four different ro robotic tending cells. Uh, it's controlled by a Rockwell PLC. We also have the ability to connect. FANUC has an MT-Link I, which is a, another industry 4.0 solution similar to um, machine metrics um, that you can track and analyze data. So we're trying to create these technicians that are learning how to use this equipment so they can get hired and, and become immediately effective, or that learning curve to get that on-the-job training um, that's, that are process-specific to your company um, are, are streamlined. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Ari DeHouse, who is the author of The Living Company, is your ability to learn faster than your competition is your only sustainable competitive advantage. Um, and I think this is critical as we you know, look at um, an increasingly, glo increasingly global um, uh, manufacturing and global competition. So in 2021, there were over 500,000 robots, in industrial robots installed globally. China installed 268,000 of them. That's more robots than every other country combined. So China is seeing the need to automate. Previously, they were able to, um, you know, kind of, we'll, we'll say, exploit their lower cost labor markets. They had some, you know, definitely some bad press on how they treated their employees. Well, you know, as we're seeing some of that reshoring effort, they're seeing the need to automate. Um, and so they're adding automation at a prolific rate. And it's, this is not meant to be a xenophobic in a way, and I hope, I hope it's in, in the sense that I, I, I hope that they do have a growing consumer base, because we're seeing that they're, they're kind of starting to become kind of like Americans, where they want to have nice cars and all the electronics and all this stuff. So hopefully this is an opportunity for them to, to work and, and support their, their own growing economy. Um, in, in, in a similar sense, we can support our own. And we're, we're seeing that it doesn't make sense to have parts that we have to wait that are sitting in the, the Long Beach shipping port on a carrier waiting to get offloaded for weeks, just floating in the ocean when we could manufacture it down the road. You know, we could manufacture and, and support our needs locally. So fast forward to 2022, uh, the rest of the world kind of caught up, so, but it was still pretty close. So there are 590,000 robots. China installed 290. The rest of the world installed 300,000. But if you look at those numbers between 268,000 and 290 um, over the last two years, they're still installing and implementing more robots than every other country combined. This is um, also an area, I know we have some you know, Department of Defense thing. I think this is actually another critical component you know, you know, for defense as well. They have the capability to build you know, two warships in a month. We can do two in a year. Um, so we, we, I, I kind of said, you know, if we look at the, you know, the arms race, this is more of a robotic arm race now instead of the, that, that type of arm race. But we are competing. It's your ability to learn faster than your competition is your only sustainable competitive advantage. This should be something that is, uh, I don't know, a little frightening for uh, um, you know manufacturers when you see that you know they're they're trying to use automation to reduce their costs. So we we need to do that. We need to utilize technology to compete. You know the the best F1 racers out there, you know come up with the best car possible and the best human minds, and they use that technology in the human brain to race. You know, and, and we're we're in the same competition. Um, and it's good, it inspires innovation, causes us to, um, to, to be creative and, and to compete. So for some of you here, maybe you're new to automation, I know this was kind of the part of the conference was to talk about you know, wanting to automate. So if you haven't automated, don't have robots or uh, CNC machining or some of the industry for me, I was like, where, where do you begin? You know, is it, is it go big or go home? You know, the movie iRobot where they had the robots building robots, the, the, the typical lights out factory that everyone dreams of. So you just drop some raw material in, it goes on an AGV, it's delivered to the robot, to the machining cell. Um, that is a possibility. You know, in fact, uh,
So these are um, Fanex renowned, uh, renowned factories uh, in, at the Yamanash Prefecture in Japan. That's where our headquarters are out of. We got 16 million square feet. I was, I was lucky enough to go over there um, in, in May to see some of the manufacturing. Um, we do have full-on robots building robots. Um, this is the CNC factory. So highly automated applications. Um, so most of the yellow robots and collaborative robots are built in Japan, and then the location in Michigan uh, has global responsibility for paint robots. So any finishing and coating and paint robots are built in our location in Michigan. That's how that location started in uh, early 80s. They partnered with General Motors to come up with a, a servo-driven paint robot. Um, and the, that heritage still runs strong and that we manufacture all the paint robots globally. Um, but you can see some of the potential for being able to automate vision system, gear meshing that wrist, uh, wrist assembly. They even you know, have the robots um, with a nut runner and we'll put Loctite on the bolts. So there's opportunities to highly automate. Um, but this may be, if you're new to automation, this may be kind of what you're thinking like automation is. It's this super advanced high level, um, but there are different on-ramps to getting into automation. So in one of those in particular is collaborative robot or cobots as they're known. Um, these are really good for, um, for small or mid-sized companies or somebody who's just trying to cut their teeth on automation. Um, one is that it, it, it helps to eliminate the need for specially trained uh, employees. There are some easier to use tablet interface, block programming, drag and drop icons. Um, they're quick to deploy, um, real easy to teach a program. Um, right there you can move the robot by hand, easy to redeploy, so from one, one station to the next. So maybe you, you have um, um, <clears throat> kind of a, a low volume, high mix uh, shop. You could quickly program an application with this robot and then move it over so maybe from a milling machine to a turning machine. Um, I, I was at a show last week in South Carolina and we integrated a robot on the show floor in about 15 minutes from a FANUC, control to a, a FANUC robot to a FANUC controlled machine. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, they're inherently safe, um, you know, really um, there's no extra components needed, whereas a yellow robot would typically need, you know, some fencing um, involved. In, but really all applications you do really need to do a risk assessment, you know, and, and try to evaluate what's going on. So we say it's inherently safe because they, they do have four sensors in, in the inside of the robot, um, they're, they're slower, their speed and force limited, but if I were to take, you know, we always joke about if I were to take a steak knife and put this in the, in the collaborative robots end of arm tool here, would that be a collaborative application? And the answer would be no, that would just not be, not be safe. Um, they, they save floor space, again, because you don't need all those additional guard, guards and barriers, but this is a, a great on-ramp to potentially automating your facility. Um, and it's a good start for as your company grows. So um, collaborative plus robot, combine the two words together. Um, that's where we talk about cobot. One of the big differences is that it's, it's meant to work in collaboration with humans. Um, so they can work, work together in, in the same space and occupy those same location. And, and the speed of the robot is comparable to a human moving um, s slowly. So they're fenceless, interactive, and generally categorized as, as safe. Um, so looking at these robots here, so we have our, our green robot was our color indicator for the collaborative robot, and then we also have the, the new CRX style um, form factor with the green stripe, and then we have our yellow is our traditional industrial robot arm. Um, which of these robots are colla collaborative? Technically, all of them by the safety standard. Combining an industrial robot with a, an area sensor will allow that industrial robot to, to move at its full industrial speed capability, but you can set up zones. So as a person approaches, that robot would slow down. As they get too close, that yellow robot would actually physically stop. Whereas a collaborative robot or traditional collaborative robot would be able to continue moving. Um, and then if there was a, a collision that occurred and based on your risk assessment, you can set certain thresholds for how much contact force is, is gonna be applied. You can also even pair this area sensor with a collaborative robot and allow that robot, collaborative robot to go above um, what the typical collaborative speed would be, but you'd have to dial it back when people get into that, that area. Um, so here's kind of a structure, but um, it's showing this as, a, as 
is kind of a circle, but some of those sensors you can actually dictate the geometry. There's a software that you can plug in and you get a visualization and you can control those, those fields for, all right, this is my, uh, you know, my stop zone or my slow speed, safe operations boat speed. This is my stop speed. Um, and you can do the same if you were to integrate that with a collaborative robot. So this is collaborative again. It's fenceless, it's interactive, and under the proper risk assessment that's done, it would be considered a safe collaborative application, even using an industrial robot. And you get that same production speed. A um, couple just, I'll click through these. So again, just kind of a comparison between a cobot and then a, um, a, and an industrial robot. You know, they're typically gonna be slower than an industrial robot. Um, they are designed, well, I won't say they're designed to hit you, but they can hit you, uh, the collaborative robot, as opposed to the yellow ones. Um, you know, they're gonna be easier to use. The more industrial robot would generally require more, more, more training. Um, the, the teach pendant's a bit different, but again, not that difficult to overcome, not that difficult of a barrier. Um, but I'll kind of speed up for time's sake here. Um, for, for the CRX, one of the highest teaching, you know, value point propositions for this is that it is easy to teach. So we have a hand-guided manual teaching. Um, we can select different, different ways of moving the robot, whether it's free or translation. You can customize so you can actually just grab onto the robot and physically move it with your hands to a position and then teach that, that location and how you want it to move to that specific waypoint. Um, uh, easy to use, again, uh, we have a, you know, if you're a CNC user and, um, and they're f uh, familiar with the, the MPG, the manual pulse generator, um, they can jog the robot and, and use that if you want to just coordinate X, Y, Z movements. So front to back, side to side, up and down from where it moves the tooling, similar to the claw game where you try to win the stuffed animal, but they always just get your quarter anyway. Um, but with a six axis robot, you also have yaw, pitch, and roll, so you get those advantages as well. Um, some other features that we have in, so if you create a, a work frame or you have a fixture that's at a specific angle, you can easily normalize the face plate or the tooling to that surface. Um, helps with teaching points and teaching positions. Um, there's a lot of different, so this is kind of nice on the screen, shows some of the icons of the different programming features. And those icons would be the, the programming instructions or the blocks that you, uh, uh, the programmer would utilize to control the robot. If you're familiar with our old teach pendant program, so there is a capability to either view it in this icon-based format, or you can view it in a traditional FANUC teach pendant program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we do have some other features too to make um, machine tending easier. So one of those is um, being able to easily center the center. The, the chuck on a turning center. Um, it makes sure that it's, it's aligned properly um, a, as the chuck closes so it doesn't mi get misaligned. Um, and then we also have a lot of process plugins. Um, so a lot of times the, the challenge is a, a robot is, when, when you buy a robot, it's just the robot, the controller, and then the, the teach pendant or the tablet PC. However, depending on your application and what you're doing, is defined by the end of arm tool that you put on the robot. Whether it's a mechanical gripper like this, vacuum suction cup, it could be an arc welding torch. Um, we have a lot of partners that we work with um, that have these you know, packages that are already designed and engineered for um, the CRX. You can even send them, like Shunk for example, you can send them a, a rudimentary drawing of your part. They'll recommend what tool to use and they'll even print, either 3D print or machine your gripper fingers so you get a whole kit together. So it's the mounting screws, um, the, the cable, and then there's a process plugin, almost like if you install an app on your phone, there's apps that go along with that different end of arm tool. Um, I know Vention's here, so we've got custom solutions for different enclosures or rails. Um, so if you wanted the robot on like a seventh axis rail, you can move back and forth. I'm sure, I don't want to steal their thunder. I know they're here, um, but they're just a few. So. So that's some of the a barrier to entry sometimes is, okay, we have a robot, but how am I gonna grip my part? How am I gonna hold my part? Well, we have a lot of solution partners that work with that. Um, the other thing is we have a, you know, a wide array of system integrators as well that can help um, sometimes that first, first application. It might be good to get someone who's done it before. Um, we do also have free online training that's available. You can go to CRX um, at fanicamerica.com and, and create a username and you can get on and and learn how to use our, our, our collaborative robot as an introductory course. 
you know, generally we say, uh, you know, collaborative robots are going to be easy um, or easier, but I, I don't, I don't want to oversell it too much because things can get complicated. You know, a lot of times when, um, if you are in, in typical integration sense, a lot of other collaborative robot companies will say, oh, you can just wheel this robot right up to the machine and, and instantly you're machine tending. All right, well, how are we communicating with the, you know, uh, the door open, door closed? Is the, is the robot going to do that manually? You know, is the chuck open, chuck closed? Um, so right now, there's, there are some challenges with integration. So I would say work with an integrator if you can to at least get over that first um, hump and that, you know, that first challenge. And then if you have enough internal talent, you know, they can kind of, you know, do the little R&D rip off and duplicate of the in system integrators. Um, you know, training, and then you can, you know, move on and expand if you want to add more automation. But, you know, there's a lot of things to consider with how the, the CNC and the robot or the robot and what other peripheral equipment are going to be communicating. Um, so one in particular, so, it, you know, just uh, if we're looking at the machine tool side, um, we do have a, a robot uh, an option called Robot Onsite, which is a quick integration between FANUC to FANUC. So if you have a FANUC CNC control, and a FANUC robot, you don't have to deal with this mess of cables and the integration. Um, we have, you can use it simply an ethernet port and um, there's a macro read and write access software option that can be added to the robot and the control and basically at the end of a CNC program, you can set a uh, macro variable bit, bit to one or zero and the robot can read that. So at the end of a program that you'd set that bit to one and that would indicate to the robot um, that it's time to load or unload um, the machine tool. And it's done basically, it's a IO list interface between a FANUC robot and a FANUC control. So you do get some easier integration um, and deployment, quick, quick deployment. So this was a, um, the option I had set at the show floor. We were able to integrate a FANUC collaborative robot with a CNC machine in, in about 15 minutes on the show floor. Um, so that's some other options. UK it does support it on older model controls as well. So um, it goes all the way back to the FANUX servo system uh, 16IB, which is like I think like 2002, if I'm not mistaken. So gives you an opportunity. Another nice feature, as I said, they're quick to deploy. Um, so you can we our vision systems and are all capable there. Um, it's hard to see, but there is a, a marker, almost like a, a QR code that is uh, installed on the front of that robo drill. So if that cart is wheeled up to the machine, that robot can go through a various, um, various postures and sh shoot images of that marker or that target, and it will align and adjust all the load unload programs based off that machine. So if you're out of skew, and the robots usually would go to the same position. It can use its vision, so if it turned, it would always continue to go back and offset for that change um, to the machine. So easily to easily align a, a robot on a cart to an existing machine tool. The other nice thing about the, you know, the, as you look into a collaborative robot, so we've got you know over 220 robot variants. Um, so if you start off with a collaborative robot, but then you want to get into the higher speed industrial robot, Fanuc has that portfolio. You know, we've got all the way from 0.5 kilogram all the way up to 2,300 kilograms. So if you need to just lift something really, really heavy, we've got the robot that'll do that. Um, so that you can expand and, and then you, and have a common platform from a CRX collaborative robot all the way through to our our industrial product, product line. Um, other things, so the, the yellow um, robots do also have the ability to have that tab, same tablet PC, or TP, if, um, if, you're, if you're, you know, that's what you learned on, on the collaborative and wanted to deploy industrial robots, we do have that as an available feature as well um, going forward. Um, the tablet TP is nice because you do have some screen customizations that you can do. You can utilize it as its own um, IHMI and, and write your own custom screens. It is a touch screen format, so it does give you a lot of flexibility um, in, that, in that realm. Um, another thing to consider too, um, if you're really apprehensive about um, adding automation or not sure if it's going to be right for you, there's something called robots as a service. So basically this is robot rental. Uh, you can rent it. Um, they would come in, and there's a couple of companies that offer this this service. They come in, they evaluate your 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 process, and then you you actually don't really even have to pay until it's actually producing and and, and working 
within the, the quote parameters of your, we'll say, lease agreement. Um, so that, that's an opportunity for if you don't want to you know, risk the initial expense of adding a collaborative robot, this is something that you could investigate um, as the robots as a service. Um, so, and I think the other part is, like I said, work with a great partner. I so said we've had over a, over a thousand system integrators um, in our network. Um, we have local support here from, uh, you know, from a service service side. Um, you know, we have something like five, five or six million dollars of spare part inventory read, readily available on our shelf, um, and we have a, a commitment to 24-hour response time for down robots. So. Um, and with the combination of our service support and then our schools that we're trying to train the next generation of workers, um, that, that's something that I think will help to take down that barrier to entry if you're considering automation. Um, dedicated service and support, we, we do have something that's kind of unprecedented in the industry. Our service first statement is, as long as you are using that product, we will continue to support you. So we do not obsolete anything or say this is no longer supported. When I was in, in Japan back in May, they had uh, touring the facilities, they had test and repair stands for equipment that was manufactured in the 70s. You know, so they were still being able to service and, and, and repair those components to keep that customer that was using that stuff in production. Um, so, um, if there is anything, you know, what has present, you know, if, if for all, maybe a question I propose to you is, if you have thought about automation, what is something that maybe has prevented you um, from taking that leap? One thing we've looked at, and they refer to what I think is open bin sorting, so oh. the stuff comes in and it's not presented the same way all the time, and so we're trying to, that's what we're, I don't say struggling with, but that's what we're looking to do. Okay. Have you looked at, um, ha have you connected with the FANUC uh, salesperson in your area to get do an automation audit and maybe even evaluate those parts? Uh, not directly, but we've been to the, the plastic shows and stuff and, and been to some automation things. And then mm -hmm. it's, I'd say in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of advancement in that area from what I know. Yes, that's for sure. Yep, so FANUC has some solutions for that with 3D uh, area uh, sensors, or, and um, that's maybe just being able to detect that there's something within a bin. Um, but we do work with a lot of, a lot of third party, high, higher advanced vision systems as well. Um, that's another thing that FANUC offers, is the reason I asked if he's been in contact with his FANUC salesperson, is that we offer automation audits. Uh, you can contact us and uh, we'll schedule an appointment. We can walk through your facility. Um, our sales staff is going through plants and automation um, in facilities all, all over their territory. So they have kind of a, you know, a vision and have seen a lot of different applications. So there might be something that you're considering automating, um, but then they might look over and go, oh no, that's, that's your bottleneck right there. That's your, that's your issue. Or the other part of it is you know, you've got to get buy-in sometimes from upper management. And, we, we, we don't want to tackle maybe the hardest application first. Maybe we tackle the easy one first and you show them, look at this return on investment, home run out of the park, and then they give you the blessing to proceed on to the more advanced um, and, and the higher investment opportunities. So um, if we could, I'd give you my in information. I'd get you in contact with the local rep and we can take a look at those parts. Our applications engineers, if, you, if you're able to ship us some, um, we can evaluate them in our, in our labs at the Rochester Hills facility, or we can even come in, um, you said Department of Defense at one point, so if we can get clearance, you know, and that works, uh, <laughs> we'll try to get in there. Anybody else, anything else that maybe thought of what prevented you initially from jumping into, into adding automation? No? All right, well, that's all I had. Before I, I pass the torch over, um, I do want to just um, pass it over to Jen, Jen uh, Stevens. Uh, she works as an uh, industrial trainer. So she's someone that has gone through, works with uh, Tech Ed products, but has gone through and, and been certified on the FANUC product um, and does workforce development training. And it, if I'd like to turn it over to Jen to kind of share her experience with working with uh, FANUC robots and, uh, and equipment in schools near, around the neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, my voice is a little weak today, so I'll try as best I can. Um, I'm actually uh, have a quite a few roles. I do work with Tech Ed products. Uh, when they sell a product, a lot of times I'll go out and install it, but also train the trainers on how to work with it. And not only train them how to work with it, but also how to teach it. 
Um, I also work with Mount Wachusett Community College, uh, which is in nor uh, North Central Mass. And we actually started a manufacturing program uh, to train people on robots and automation. And we're fortunate enough to get about a million dollars worth of equipment out of a few grants and a couple thousand square feet of training space. Um, the companies in the area of uh, Devon's Mass, which a lot of them are in uh, medical device companies, were uh, on our advisory board for starting our program. Uh, so a lot of what uh, we purchased was dictated by the type of equipment they had. So we have a number of FANUC robots, a lot of equipment uh, purchased through TechEd Products from Amatrol, who is also a partner with FANUC um, in coming up with new training equipment. Um, I've taken the training at FANUC. In fact, this summer I spent uh, another week there on my uh, fourth and fifth course. Next one's going to be the collaborative robot. I'm hoping to get that done within this year. <laughs> um, we teach a lot of students. Right now I'm working uh, under a grant funded by Career Centers and in par partnership with the company Insulet. Uh, we are training over a five-week period students who've never been in manufacturing. Um, teaching them the basics. So we're going through um, measurement tools, um, electrical systems, pneumatic systems, programming PLCs, programming FANUC robots, a uh, little bit on mechanical drives. And um, when they get out, Insulet actually interviews them. And the last cohort, uh, three or four people were actually hired uh, by Insulet. We're starting our, our second cohort. Uh, they started uh, a week ago. I start teaching them tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm also working with um, J-Bill in Clinton, Mass. J-Bill was able to get through Mount Wachusett um, in the state of Massachusetts a workforce development grant where the students were being paid by the grant to attend class with the promise that when they finished both modules that they would uh, actually get a raise. So we've actually moved some equipment right into j -Bill's facilities because they have classrooms. So a lot of stuff uh, that Mount Wachusett has bought actually is portable. Right now we have uh, two robots at j -Bill. We're bringing a third FANUC robot in at the end of this month. And this next training session is PLCs, robots, general troubleshooting of machines, and about 87 hours worth of training. Also going on in Massachusetts right now, uh, the Northeast Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative. I've been working with them to develop uh, a program of 300 hours of training along with a 2,000 hour um, apprenticeship program spread out over two years, which is in the process of going through approval right now. They're hoping to actually start this program in uh, the beginning of this coming December. I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Um, unfortunately, one of our big problems, besides having people trained in automation, is instructors trained in automation. Um, I am very busy <laughs> working in a lot of different places, and I am always looking for people to enter this field of uh, of instruction, uh, so I'd love to see some of the retiring baby boomer, boomers jump into this that have this kind of knowledge, because that would be a huge benefit. Uh, and I'm going to actually cut, uh, say one more thing, and over on this uh, table over on the wall here, there's some information about workforce training grants that you could actually work with your local community college. So each one of the colleges has a service area. So Mount Wachusett service area does not reach out here. You'd be dealing with uh, Berkshire Community College. And <laughs> so um, you could actually contact them and actually look into getting a workforce training grant. Uh, with that said, I'm going to pass it back. Thank you. All right, I know how we're doing on time. Um, my yeah, I think we're unfortunately out of time at this point, just okay. so we can have, have room for everyone else. But um, Joe and Jen and Brian and Rick from TechEd Products will be here the rest of the day. And definitely, if you want to take a look at the Cobot, they'll be here to show you all the, all the bells and whistles. 
Uh, right now, we'll take a quick five-minute break so everybody can stretch their legs, hit the restroom, and we'll be back next with the good gents from Invention. <laughs>